Okay, hi there. In this video, we'll take a look at the importance, the significance of the minimum efficient scale of production. So what is the minimum efficient scale? Well, it's a concept in microeconomics, which becomes quite important when you're discussing the theory of the firm and market structures. It's defined as the long term scale of production or the scale of output where a firm benefits from all of the economies of scale available to it. In other words, it's when increasing returns turns to constant returns and the average cost of production in the long run reaches a minimum point. And typically it's a level of output where you're within, let's say, 5% of the minimum feasible unit cost. So, for example, Q1 would be minimum efficient scale. You've more or less reached the lowest point of the average cost curve. Uh, Q2, the average cost curve, is pretty much the same. There's no significant cost advantage from scaling from Q1 to Q2. Beyond the minimum efficient scale, of course, there's the possibility of diseconomies of scale or decreasing returns to scale. So why does the MES vary by industry? Well, of course, it depends on the nature of production, the nature of supply to consumers. In some industries, the fixed costs are very high. The costs of setting up the plant or the network or the business are particularly high. But the marginal cost of selling to one extra consumer is low. Now, in this situation, there's a high ratio of fixed to marginal cost. And this means that increasing the scale of production will reduce the average cost because the overheads are being spread over a much bigger range of output. So we say that some industries uh, resemble what's called a natural monopoly. What that means, it's an industry where the average cost in the long run keeps on falling over a very large, significant range of production. However, in other industries, in other markets, there are some scale economies, but they're not necessarily significant. The advantages to being large relative to your competitors are fairly low. Indeed, you can get to the minimum efficient scale at a fairly low level of output. There's lots of interest at the moment, of course, in these huge digital technology companies, uh, the GAFAM companies, Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Alphabet, otherwise known as Google, and Facebook. Indeed, some of these businesses have, at some point in the last couple of years, reached a market valuation of over, of over $1 trillion dollars. Although, as of May 2019, the market cap of those shares have fallen in line with the, the fall in the US stock market in recent weeks. But here, clearly, we have businesses on an enormous scale. Google has more than 90% of UK mobile search, for example. Amazon, the everything store, is in the news pretty much every day. Facebook has an enormous uh, platform lead in terms of social networks, of course. So scale clearly matters. It's very hard to estimate the minimum efficient scale for a social network or for a hardware company or for a logistics company such as Amazon. It's almost impossible to get real data on the minimum efficient scale. Airbnb, another really good example of a business which has scaled very quickly. Have a look at this chart. Airbnb is making a big dent in the kind of hotel market in the United States. Nearly a fifth of bookings in the United States are now going the way of Airbnb. Hotels typically have made in, in the past, they make about 70% of, of consumer bookings um, now, but five years ago it was over 90%. So Airbnb very quickly has managed to scale its production from 3% in the States to nearly 20%. Now clearly Airbnb as a business is achieving rapid, significant scale increases be interesting to see what their unit costs are in terms of efficiency. I mentioned before the idea of a natural monopoly. If you get a question on the national grid, uh, water utilities, uh, the train network, uh, perhaps even postal services, there might be a case for saying there's a natural monopoly. Uh, London Underground, water and sewage networks, for example. And the diagram to draw, this is a simplified version, just to get the idea across is that the long run average cost keeps falling across a very big range of output from Q1 to Q2 to Q3 and so on. The unit cost is falling. Of course, the marginal cost would lie below the average 
to drive the average down. So what's the significance? If you're using this term in evaluation, what's the significance of the minimum efficient scale? Well, crucially, crucially, pardon me, the size of minimum efficient scale relative to the size of the market is the crucial metric. Let me go through it again. The size of minimum efficient scale, where you achieve all your scale economies, relative to the size of the market is what's really important. Because that basically says it indicates how many firms operating at scale that an industry can support. Let me give you three examples. If the minimum efficient scale is estimated to be, let's say, 30% of the market, then, well, 3 times 30 is 90%, but 4 times 30 is 120. So up to three firms could possibly reach the minimum efficient scale. That would, that would suggest the market is oligopolistic, perhaps a duopoly with two dominant firms. Let's say Coca-Cola and Pepsi, or Airbus and Boeing. However, in contrast, if the minimum efficient scale is very low, let's say just 2% of the market, well, do the maths, up to 50 businesses can reach MES. And of course, that takes us much more towards, let's say, monopolistic competition, maybe even thinking about perfect competition, the theoretical market structure. But either way, a less concentrated market, a much more fragmented market structure with a low concentration ratio. And going back to our natural monopoly example, if the MES is very high, let's say, well, 80% of the market, only one firm, only one single supplier can fully exploit the internal economies of scale. We call that a natural monopoly. Now, here are some key A-star evaluation points to finish with. First of all, the minimum efficient scale can and does change with technological advances. So in many of these digital markets, online suppliers, whatever it is, online fashion, online music businesses, online trading businesses, um, lots of firms can very quickly set up cloud computing services and digital platforms so you can scale particularly quickly and it uh, becomes very hard to, to estimate what the minimum efficient scale actually is. Second point, the minimum efficient scale is not, repeat, not a single output. It's much more likely to be a range of production over which, let's say, the cost per unit is broadly constant, basically the same. So don't necessarily have a U-shaped curve. Oftentimes, businesses operate with fairly flat cost curves in the long term. Third point, the minimum efficient scale depends on how you define the market. This is really crucial for evaluation. How you define the market. Uh, are we talking about Airbus and Boeing, for whom the global market is, is particularly important? Are we talking about the regional market for, let's say, what have you, insurance in the European Union? Are we talking about a national market, the market for train services and local flights in the UK? Are we talking about a much more localised situation, the number of taxi companies operating in London, for example, or parcel delivery firms operating in Manchester? Or are we talking about hyper local markets, literally the, the economics of the, of the high street or the economics of the village or the very small town. These are very important distinctions. MES depends on how you define the market. It also depends on the nature of the supply chain. So you can make a case for saying that network rail is a natural monopoly uh, because it has to operate all the track and the signals and the stations, what have you. But that actually the train operating services themselves or the billing equipment or the ticketing systems, actually they could be run by lots of different companies. Indeed, increasingly are. My fifth point is that even in a world of scale, even in the world of what I call the land of the giants, those big, incredibly large global companies, small firms can and small firms do prosper. They can make money particularly if they target a niche element of a bigger market and uh, offer a bespoke, premium, uh, differentiated service. A couple of examples to finish with. Aldi is really interesting. I know many of you follow the grocery sector. And Aldi and Lidl, the German discounters, have made big strides in the UK, uh, while Aldi is now making huge strides in the United States. It has over nearly 2,000 stores in 35 states. It's actually on track to become America's third biggest supermarket chain and, and Walmart is in its sights. However, 
don't necessarily assume this is the result of hyperscale. The business is growing, but of course at the local level, part of all their success is that they don't have big hypermarkets, big supermarkets. They've chosen mid-range stores. Typically, they only stock about 1,400 items, many of which are own private label, which is much cheaper, of course, so they don't stock many of the brands. And uh, they find all kinds of ways to reduce their costs at operating at store level on a lower, smaller scale than the big hypermarkets. And many of the supermarkets are, are uh, taking note of this in the battle. And the last point I want to make to you in this revision video is a, a misconception that some students uh, often put in their answers. And in, in that if you minimise your cost in the long run, you're maximising your profits. That is not the case. Please don't confuse the two. A minimum efficiency scale is not the same as maximising profit. Clearly, it depends on demand. It depends on average and marginal revenue. A good example to finish with is Netflix. Many of you will have a Netflix subscription. And the chart on the left-hand side shows the number of paid subscribers globally, now in excess of 150 million. Uh, however, despite that, Netflix is making a sizable loss. Indeed, their free cash flow deficit is expected to peak in 2019 at more than three and a half billion dollars. They operated over nearly $500 million loss just in the first three months of 2019. They're having to spend huge amounts of money on um, new content, partly because the film companies are withdrawing their own content from Netflix platforms. And indeed, Netflix may well run out of money at some point unless the shareholders uh, got very, very deep pockets. Well, Netflix is a scale business. It's scaled remarkably quickly, but it's not necessarily making any money. There we go. Uh, this is an important idea in your microeconomics. I think it's a really interesting concept. Uh, you just need to think about the industries and the nature of cost and supply. And I'm sure you'll be able to come up with some great evaluation points in your exams. So thank you very much.